Yes. Um, thank you all for being here today. I'm very delighted to introduce Dr. Lars Fritsche from the University of Michigan. And as you know, um, age-related macular degeneration is a terrible blinding disease, and you're going to hear this morning about the genetics of this from the largest case control study on the genetics of this disease. And Dr. Lars, Lars Fritsche, who earned his PhD from the University of Regensburg for in human genetics, and also did a postdoctoral fellowship under the direction of Dr. Bernard Weber, also at the University of Regensburg. Uh, we were lucky enough to get him here in the United States under the direction of Gonzalo Abacasis. He did a second postdoctoral fellowship in biostatistics, and he has shouldered much of the burden for in the first authorship for the papers that have come out of the AMD consortium. And you're going to hear about that today. And those papers have been published in Nature Genetics. And Lars has contributed vastly to the field in methodology and um, studying these large cohorts of over 70,000 individuals from all over the world and of different ethnicities. So please join me in a warm welcome for Lars here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. So good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure being here and being invited to have this opportunity to present in front of you. I know you are the phenotype expert, so I'm not going to um, um, discuss that so much, but more into the genetics, but that's because that's the field I'm more familiar with and where I'm most comfortable. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the large um, international AMD genomics consortium, and um, the talk will be first about the known genetics of age-related macular degeneration. Then I'm going to talk about the work of the consortium, talk a little bit ab about the design, what we are planning to do or what we plan to do in this, ex um, in this experiment and then talk about single variant test results and, and gene-based test results. I'm going into details in this, in, into this later on. And at the very end, I'm trying to do some kind of accounting on, of AMD genetics to give you an idea where we are and, and where we might be going in the future. Um, so age-related macular degeneration, as you all know, is, uh, is, uh, is one of the leading causes of blindness in the elderly. Uh, Americans also, the age of onset, onset usually about 50 years of age, um, and the prevalence increases with age. It's a progressive disease, and estimates right now are that about that are there are about 10 million affected individuals with any form of AMD in the U.S. <coughs> and it's it's a complex disease, so it has numerous risk factors like smoking and diet, and um, one of the strongest underlying causes is, uh, are the genetics, and the estimates for the heritability range between about 50 to 70 percent. And the phenotypes that I'm going to talk about, uh, these are large drusen, so early forms of AMD, yellowish deposit, deposits underneath the RPE, y as you all know. And then we have geographic atrophy um, in, in the area of the um, macular or um, the second late stage form, which is called idle neovascularization. So we have an ingrowth of small vessels underneath the RPE and that can lead to, um, to bleeding and detachment of the RPE and death of photoreceptors as well. And in my talk, I'm going to talk about those, mainly on those late stage forms because they severely affect um, the vision and also we know that the genetics of the late stage forms are stronger um, compared to the uh, early forms and they give us more power, more chances to discover genetic risk variants. That's why we're focusing on them. And so it's a, it's a complex disease. We have um, genetics, environmental and dem demogra demographic risk factors. And these, in these factors, they influence expression of, of genes or protein function. So there's a pathogenesis ongoing that lead then to the phenotype itself. And so understanding each of those categories will help to understand the other categories. So understanding the gen genetics will help to understand what's going on in the genes. Are the expression differences that can be explained by genetic variants? And, and also how can we understand the phenotype that is developing. And better understanding the phenotype will again help us to better understand the genetics. So 
the purer our phenotypes are, the better we can define the genetics of those um, late state of, of those phenotypes. <coughs> and there was a lot of progress and, and success stories in the field of genetics. And actually, the first genome-wide association study um, that was published in 2005 it was focusing on on AMD. And th these are the results as shown here. So there are 100,000 SNPs on the x-axis. So these were genome-wide distributed. And on the y-axis, you can the can see the association signal. So it's the log 10 of the p-value. And this line indicates the level and the threshold for significance. And they're identified on chromosome 1, which is here. Um, variants in the complement factor H that are strongly associated with AMD. And this was the first genome-wide association study ever to identify such strong signal. And since then, there was a lot of progress because the complement factor H indicated the alternative pathway of the complement cascade. Um, people were doing um, candidate gene analyses and they identified several other variants in other complement genes that are also associated with the disease. And um, so there are at least four other complement genes associated with AMD. And also, m people not only did candidate gene, an gene analyses, but also did larger genome-wide association studies with more variants that were analyzed and, and larger case control studies, so they had more power to find such variants. And in the, la the last, in the latest analysis, which is a, a meta-analysis of different genome-wide association studies, we increased the number by seven, and right now we're looking at about 20 um, risk loads that are known to carry risk variants that influence um, the development of AMD. <coughs> okay. And so the meta-analysis basically is, a, is an approach where we combine multiple genome-wide association studies and, and analyze them together to have more power to identify the signals. And the two, two factors that, that influence the, the chances to discover such uh, risk factors are mainly um, a little frequency, so we can have very rare variants or very common variants. And, and the second <coughs> factor, these are the effect sizes. And the effect size in this case, these are odds ratios for estimators for the relative risk. So we have effects of 1.1, meaning that the risk is increased by 10%, or odds ratio of 3 would mean a threefold increased risk, or even effect size to 50, so 50-fold increased risk. And the in this dotted line, these indicate um, the area that, that can be um, identified in genetic association studies. So we know of rare variants that have very small effects, but we, we don't have enough power to find them. Um, on the other hand, we have s it's quite unlikely to have very strong genetic risk factors that are common in the population. Um, but in between, there are factors, common variants, with modest if risk effects, so these are the common variants that presented before that were identified in the genome-wide association studies of AMD. They are quite common, and also um, we have indications that there are maybe some rare variants also associated associated with the disease, and we are trying to to fill this gap and to identify more risk variants to better understand the genetics and, and the functions that cause the disease. And for example, this is the, these are the results of the genome-wide, as of the meta-analysis that we performed. Um, but again, you can see the chromosomes on the, on the x-axis, colored in different shading. And in blue, these were the known loci at that time. And in green, these were the novel loci we identified in this approach. And we tested 2.4 million variants in a, in a sam sample of that consisted of over 7,000 AMD cases and over 50,000 controls, quite large study. And so we could identify those signals. And these signals that were all common, so the allele frequency in the populations is, is about 10%, which can be seen here. And the risk, risk effects that we, ob that, we see, uh, that we saw, especially of those novel uh, low side, they were quite moderate, uh, pretty low. So the odds ratio ranged between 1.1 to 1.3, 10% or 30% increased risk, indicating that the earlier studies that were too small could not identify those modest risk signals, but now gaining this additional power, we could f identify them. But another thing you can see is that the two major risk factors um, are the CFH gene, that's the one I mentioned before, and, and there's a locus on chromosome 10, ARMS2, HTRA1, which has a, a similar 
large risk effects, and those are the two major susceptibility loci that can explain already a large proportion of the disease. But we are also interested to identify those, those variants and those genes, because every gene will help us um, resolve this conundrum of, of the, the pathways, involved pathways, and might help us to, to guide future functional assays and maybe also therapies. So these were common variants, but ad in addition, we know of low frequencies and rare variants that have quite large risk effects. And they were all published, each one of them at least, in one nature genetics paper. And um, the frequencies are quite rare. And one variant in, in the complement factor H is extremely rare in, in, in controls and quite enriched in IND cases in the odds ratio here was estimated to be about 20. This is based on our current study. So we have a, a very strong signal that almost behaves like a Mendelian disease. So we have kind of a spectrum that reaches from rare variants to common variants, but we're also interested in the spectrum in between. So, so we know there are rare variants, we know there are common variants, so we expect there might be also some variants in between with very not so strong effects. So we want to, to fill this gap with the variants with low frequencies but intermediate effect sizes. And for that we, we followed up with a, we formed a new consortium uh, and now brought together 26 groups from over 10 countries all distributed all over the world and this star represents Salt Lake City. So I'm glad to have you on board. And, and the good thing about this analysis is now it's not a meta-analysis but it's, it's a mega-analysis. So the genotyping itself was funded by the National Eye Institute, meaning that we could genotype all our centers in a single genotyping facility, which helped us to have a centralized quality control, a harmonized <laughs> data set, which made the analysis much more easier and, and cleaner also, and helped us to, to develop uh, some analysis that I'm going to show later on. And the sample sizes, so I mentioned that there were over 50,000 individuals that were genotyped but I'm only focusing on the unrelated individuals with recent European ancestry. So having focusing on one ancestry group will help to um, minimize population stratification effects that will influence the discovery of association signals. So that's why we are focusing on Europeans only. And um, we were mainly comparing advanced AMD cases. So we had about 60,000 advanced AMD cases. So some had a CNV only, some had GA only, and some had both forms of late-stage AMD, um, and we had about 18,000 controls. Also, we had some data of, of early forms of AMD, like 4,000 cases with large drusen, or over 2,000 cases with intermediate AMD. But as I mentioned before, we, we obtained the, the best power by, by focusing on advanced AMD and comparing it with controls. And this is a, a quite large case control study and, and it's a quite balanced when you look at the ratio between cases and controls also preventing some bias in the analysis. So this is the, so we had a large sample but now what about the genotyping? And for the genotyping we, we were lucky to, um, to be the first to, to test a new genotyping platform that was developed with, uh, in cooperation with Illumina. It's called the U Illumina Human Core Exome Chip which is an, 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 a genotyping array that allows um, the genotyping of genome-wide tagging SNPs, so similar to the, to the analysis I've shown before, so genome-wide distributed common variants that might give us ideas about uh, a low side that we're not aware of. So by just randomly picking signals among the genome, we might get lucky and find an associated variant. In addition to those genome-wide tagging SNPs, um, we had non-synonymous coding SNPs on the array, about 45%. And these are variants that are likely that likely influence the, the protein function of the splicing of, of, of a gene. And, and there's a strong negative selection because the, the effects of such variants are quite large. And we were interested to see if some of those variants, uh, variants are associated or not. And these variants were selected in large sequencing studies and um, they helped to design this array. In addition, we had some custom content. So we already know and knew about 20 AMD risk loci and we were interested to, to get a better picture about the, uh, about the regions, and so we added extra variants in those regions to have a better <coughs> uh, coverage, and also added some additional rare variants that we know of are associated. 
And the good thing about those genome-wide tagging SNPs is that, that we now can do a so-called imputation. So there are maybe only 250,000 variants included, but using an imputation, we can increase this number um, tenfold or even more than that by using um, a new approach, and you're probably aware of this, so we can use a, a project, so for example, the 1,000 genome project reference panel, which is a project, a project where they um, sequenced over thousands of individuals, now, and, and we now know the haplotypes of those individuals, the, the chromosomes and the, the different alleles on those chromosomes. And if we compare those haplotypes with our case control data, we can see that our, our data is much sparser, so we have some gaps in between, so question marks, we don't know what's going on there. But because we can compare those genotype and those haplotypes with the reference haplotypes, we can fill in those gaps and now increase this number of variants that we can test for an association um, tenfold. And, and in our case, we, we can impute over 11 million variants using this approach. So it didn't cost as much money besides computational power, and um, we got much more variants that we could test. When we look at the, the content of the array, Again, focusing on the genot genotype variant, so this, this is the chip content itself. We can see that we found 160,000 of those non-synonymous coding variants that were included on the design to be polymorphic in our, in our genotyping platform. So some of them were mono monomorphic. You could not observe in any of our patients, uh, um, participants, but 160 of them, 160,000 carried those variants. In addition, we had those genome-wide common SNPs and they were present in, in, all, in, in our samples, and so we had 270,000 of them. And when we look at the frequency spectrum of those variants, we can see what I indicated before, there's a strong selection against such non-synonymous coding variants, making them rare in our populations, and, and most of them have frequency below 0.5%, so there's just one heterozygous in 100 um, genotype individuals. In contrast, those tagging SNPs that are genome-wide genome distributed, um, they are mainly common, because that's the how they were designed. Um, so the, the special thing about this platform is now that we can look at those rare non-synonymous variants, and th this was not possible before. And as I said, we can now also impute our data using the 1,000 genome reference panel, and we could increase the number of variants that we could test by 11 0.5 million SNPs, and most of those SNPs are, are not non-synonymous coding, Some, so they are intronic, intergenic, so we might get an, a nice idea about regions that were not indicated before uh, by using those variants that are distributed genome-wide. And we could test them now in um, 16,000 advanced AMD cases and compare the results and um, with 18,000 controls. And this is what we get. Um, again, this is the so-called Manhattan blot, the chromosomes and the associa association signals, and you can see there's a gap, and so there's a different scale on top, so we obtained extremely small p-values, 10 to the power of minus 600 or 800, this is pretty crazy low, I was always told, so people are questioning this approach, but so just indicating these are very strong signals, and there's no doubt these are strong risk factors for AMD. And, and we could confirm most of the known AMD loci shown in blue, but reach genome-wide significance that is indicating with this red line. In addition, there are six, maybe hard to read, 60 novel AMD loci um, that we could identify. Um, so we almost doubled the number of, of AMD loci using this approach. And just a quick summary. We could confirm 18 of the 20 known AMD loci with p-values below 5 times 10 to the power of minus 8. This is <coughs> the genome-wide significance threshold. Um, um, three of the previous reported AMD loci we, we could not confirm. So one we found is not independent of another locus. So there were two loci that were pretty close together. But when correcting for the one stronger signal, we found that the other one was not significant anymore. So this was kind of a shadow effect that we identified. In addition, there was a, a gene on chromosome 6 that was much smaller, uh, the, the signal was much weaker than reported before, and we call those kind of, those effects as a winner's curse. So the, the initial discovery study had maybe some random more power to find this 
signal and, and now we, with more samples, we, we could not quite replicate this finding, but still there was some kind of peak over there. And the other locus um, that we could not replicate was previously described in Asian populations and because we are focusing mainly on European samples, we could not find the signal. So this seems to be specific for, for Japanese population and, and maybe also Chinese populations. And as I said, in there are 16 novel AMD laws that we could identify. And yeah, okay. And I'm not going to talk too much much about the function of those 16 novel laws because there's a lot of research still ongoing. So we don't understand those laws at this point. So we don't know which gene exactly is associated, but this is something that's still ongoing right now. So when we look at all those um, signals, there's 34. Um, uh, independent association signals. Um, we can again look at the two factors that influence the discovery of those risk variants. So the risk allele frequencies, I mean from from 0.01 percent to 50 or 50 to 99.99 percent, and this again is the the effect size, the odds ratios. And you can see this is the 80 percent um, power we had. So the chances to find this. Um, such variance is 80% and you can see that most of our signals we identified are um, as expected um, in this area where we had more than 80% power. But another thing you can see is that we could not identify additional signals of rare variants. So we had 160,000 non-synonymous coding variants, but we could not find new signals in, other, other in, in, in any other locus than the known AMD loci or the novel loci. So on a genome-wide level, um, we had not maybe not enough power to find those variants. But you can see here, we need a lot of um, strong effects. Uh, we need strong effects to be able to identify them. But maybe we did not have enough power, even when analyzing 16,000 cases and 18,000 controls. Of course, we, know we were not interested to, to further characterize the, the signals that we identified. And so we were interested to see if in those 34 loci, if there are additional signals, so that we have strong signals, we're interested, are there other signals underneath this, this strong primary signal? And, and we already know of such variants from previous studies, so we know of um, multiple variants in CFH, CFI, CQ, CFB, and, and C3. And now we could, because we now have the individual level data at hand, we could do a so-called sequential conditional analysis, so we could analyze common and variants combined. We had all the data at hand and, and we could stepwise condition on the top signal and I'm going to show you some examples to maybe identify secondary signals underneath this top SNP. And there's one, first of all, uh, one negative example. So this is the locus on chromosome two, one of the two major susceptibility loci, ARMS2, HTR1. And this is the top signal with the p-value of smaller than 10 to the power of minus 700. And so we were interested to maybe get an, an additional variant in this region that might help us understand this region. And maybe we, if we find a risk variant in this gene, might help us to better dissect this region. But when we conditioned on, on this top signal, so if we removed the signal, we could see a basically a, a flat line. So there was just one single signal. So even we had a 10 to the power of minus 700, when conditioning on this signal, there was nothing left in there. So there's one single signal that can explain the whole association peak in that region. So no help in differentiating, differentiating those two, two loci here, which was kind of disappointed, but, but now people can focus on, on those variants and maybe identify the, the most interesting and putatively functional variants. The other example is uh, the complement factor I which is shown here. Again, there's a strong association signal here and you can see that there are, there are other signals and the color code indicates uh, um, the, the correlation to this top variant. So these variants seem to be correlated. Um, those variants not so much correlated and this signal here is quite strong and it's dark blue meaning that the correlation is pretty low. And now by doing a conditional analysis, we could see that this is indeed an additional um, independent signal. In this case, this was the rare variant of the CFI gene that was also identified before. But you can clearly see when removing the other signal that this is, is, is very strong and even 
and actually by doing this conditional analysis we gained some power so the association signal was stronger um, after doing the conditioning than before and we did this for all our 34 loci and and we found um, nine loci where we could identify 18 secondary signals for example CFH we could do this eight times so we can we found the top SNP condition on the top SNP and repeated this seven times and still could find signals with genome-wide significance. And uh, for C2, CFB, we could do this four times and so on. So, um, And some of those signals were very rare and we could find rare vac signals in CFH, C3 and CFI. And these were the rare variants that were identified before. So we kind of confirmed those signals, but we could not identify new interesting missense variants with low frequencies. And those multiple signals can represent independently associated SNPs, but also it could be an indication for haplotypes effect. So we're still always <laughs> assuming that we genotype the true maybe causal variant, and, and those, but we could have actually missed this variant. It's hard to impute maybe, or not present on a genotyping array. So now we, we can follow up on, on those regions doing haplotype analysis to maybe identify um, haplotypes that explain those multiple signals. So it's, it's, it's an excellent um, data set to do follow-up haplotype analysis. Okay, and the three variants that I mentioned before um, that we could identify to be independently associated from the, the common non-risk variants, again, CFH, CFI, C3, and the signals are, in our data, quite strong, um, 10 to the power of minus 10, up to 10 to the power of minus 28, and, and so we had enough power to find those risk variants with genome-wide significance. And this was also not, not possible before, but now it was possible, but these were the only genome-wide significant single variants uh, that we could identify. So, um, but that's not the end because we can increase our chance to find such rare signals by doing gene-based burden tests. So not only we can compare one single variant and the frequency between cases and controls, but we can collapse variants of a gene and compare the burden, the presence of such variants between cases and controls. And, and for example, we did this pooling the non-synonymous coding variants of genes and compared the, the frequencies or the, the enrichment of such variants. And we did this for 17,000 genes with a test that's called a variable threshold test. And we could indeed um, find genes that are genome-wide significantly associated. And some of them um, were mentioned before and are known before, CFH, CFI, CFI, but also <coughs> we found TIM3. And there were other signals here indicated in gray. And we found that those signals are, are shadow effects of common variants. So after correcting for the, the stronger common variants, those signals disappeared. But CFH, CFI, and TIM3, they remained genome-wide significant. And the reason is and we found that the, the underlying um, the, the driver of those associations are very rare variants. So these are extremely rare. We did a variable threshold test. So we did not start with 1% allele frequency cutoff, but we let our um, software de detect the, the optimal threshold to do this test. And the optimal threshold was here below 0.1%. So indicating these are very rare variants. And when we come look at the burden between when you compare the burden between cases and controls, you can see that there's enrichment in cases of those variants. And the odds ratio of those pooled variants are about two to three, or in the case of TIM3, the odds ratios were about 30. So almost fully penetrant risk variants only found one, so we only found one of those um, TIM3 variants in, in, in controls, but 29 times in, in cases. And, and the reason why we find this TIM3 as um, finding quite in interesting is that we enriched our uh, genotyping platform for a special kind of mutations. And so we, we, we added known source species fundus dystrophy variants to our genotyping platform. And we could predict also maybe other such similar variants with similar consequences. And source species fundus dystrophy is a monogenetic macular degeneration, probably known to you. And so we could find among our AMD patients some that carry such 
extremely highly, highly penetrant variants um, and that were not found in, in controls. So just to summarize the, the findings, um, we almost doubled the number of AMD loci in our analysis doing the single variant analysis. We, we did um, a sequential conditional analysis and we could, in, a to um, could in, in total identify 52 statistically significant independent variants. And in addition, using those gene-based burden tests, we found very rare variants that uh, in CFH, CFI, and TIMP3 that influenced the risk of developing AMD. And these are ex excellent starting points for follow-up experiments. So those variants are interesting to follow up. And, the, and as I said before, the, the novel loci that we identified, um, they are currently also followed up using expression data and um, doing additional fine mapping, additional imputations to better understand what's going on there. So, and for example, when, when pooling those, the, the loci that we identified, we can perform a pathway analysis to see are there certain pathways that are enriched in those AMD loci that are associated with AMD. And indeed, we can identify several pathways that show an, um, quite an enrichment. So not surprisingly, we found that the pathway, the regulation of complement cascaders is associated, lipid protein metabolism is associated, and also collagen structures, of fibrillus, um, the assembly of collagen fibrils and other multimeric structures seem to be associated, highly enriched in our signals. And in addition, there's a rather weaker signal, but also the degradation of extracellular matrix seems to play a role in, in AMD. So this, this is just an example how we can follow up on, on, the, on the signals that we identified. So the question is, where are we now? So how much can we explain of the, of the heritability of the disease? That's always an interesting question to know. Did we already explain all the data? Uh, so is there still work to do, work left to do for us to do association studies? And um, one helpful estimate is the chip heritability, so the estimating the variants explained by the genetic, by the genetic so. Um, and we could use our genotype data to estimate um, the chip heritability and, and, and this estimate depends on the prevalence we assume and so we assumed three different prevalences of one, five and ten percent and so the heritability could be between thirty and, and sixty percent and we can compare this to the signals we identified and what you can see here these are the um, independently associated variants we identified and so there's still a large gap that we cannot explain with the, the signals we identified at this point but another thing you can see is that the 50% of the chip heritability seems to be explainable by, by four AMD loci, by CFH, ARMS2, HDR1, C2, CFB, and, and C3. And those novel loci have much weaker effects and maybe are uh, less frequent. And they only contribute um, a little to this overall um, chip heritability. But as, as I said before, this they help us identify interesting pathways that, that we need to explore and maybe find um, targets for, for therapy. Another interesting thing is to, to, to use this data now to, to estimate the risk of individuals. So we can, using all the variants, we can come up with a genetic risk score and we can classify uh, maybe cases and controls and what we found when doing um, um, standard area under curve analysis the receiver operator curve, we could find that, that our variants that can distinguish cases and controls quite well. So the area under the curve is 0 0.8. This is much higher compared to other complex diseases, but it's maybe not high enough to do presymptomatic testing. And, and one thing here is that with the, the known AMD loss with the strong risk effects with the co more common variants, these are the strongest contributors here. And this analysis uh, that I'm showing here is just based on genetic risk factors, by adding additional risk factors like smoking or age, we can even increase uh, the predictive power of such a test. But what does it mean for a population? And, and there's another interesting analysis we, we could do so we can kind of um, analyze the impact of the associated SNPs. And, and what we did, um, we we split our, um, um, a simulated population, so we simulated a population using our curves controls data uh, and simulated population with AMD prevalence of 5% um, into 10 equal parts. So for example, if there are 
1,000 individuals, um, 50 of them will develop AMD and, and we found that the distribution of those um, individuals increases with the higher risk score, but we found only three, uh, that we found only that three of 10 uh, of, the, uh, of the 10 D styles have an, 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 an risk that is higher than the average, which is um, in this case 5%, meaning that the, the risk itself is as expected in, is so the, the proportion of affected individuals is higher in the individuals that have a higher risk score. But when you look at the, at the top risk category, you can see that only 20.7% of them will be affected by AMD. So even being in this high risk group means not necessarily that you will develop AMD. In this case, we estimated that the chances to develop AMD will be 23%. This kind of indicates that there are limitations in using those risk scores to, to predict the disease. Of course, you can ask, what if you look at the percentiles of the top 1%, so the 1% of the population that have the highest risk, and still in this category, only 50, less than 50% um, will develop AMD according to this estimation. So there are limitations in using those genetic risk scores to predict um, the development of AMD. So in conclusion, um, I, I hope I showed you some interesting results from the largest centralized genotyping effort on AMD. Again, we doubled the number of AMD loci. We could identify 52 statistically independent variants that now we can use for risk analyses and, and, and also represent starting points for follow-up analyses. Um, we think that the major common genetic risk variants have been identified, at least the, the common that have strong risk effects or moderate risk effects, but still there could be common variants um, with um, weaker risk effects. Um, but based on the, the common variants, we might have identified most of them. But there are many more rare variants and low frequency variants that still are uh, undiscovered uh, and, and we're working on on that to, to fill this gap, as I mentioned before. So now having this better picture of AMD genetics, we now can do expression analysis, protein function uh, assays to um, decipher the, the multiple signals we identified. And hopefully we can um, maybe predict even um, the late stage forms. And, and one thing I did not mention is that we found one signal that seems to be specific for one form of AMD, but not the other. So in this case, it was a, a gene involved only, uh, uh, was only associated with wet AMD, but not with geographic atrophy. So there, there might be some risk factors that um, can differentiate between the, the late stage forms. And this might help us to understand how those two late stage forms develop and what are their, their causes. Um, there were a lot of people involved, and I'm just mentioning here the, the centers of the International AMD Genomics Consortium. It's probably not enough time to read all of them. So there were 26 centers, and we are now, we drafted a first paper, and it's currently under review, or I think we are in the process of submitting it. And so there are a lot of authors involved. And so this was quite challenging, I think, to come up with this author list and get the affiliations right. and. Um, and there was, I would say, there was one core team that, that helped to do this kind of analysis and, and where this phenotype data, genotype data, and, and everything was analyzed. And, and so I'm, I'm very grateful to work in such an excellent team. And I'm also thankful to the people of uh, my colleagues in, in Michigan um, that helped me analyze the data. So we were on a retreat, we did some cowboy games, and so, and actually the struggle in our department is that we're all struggling to get most of our computational resources. So that's what you're doing in Michigan. So thank you very much for your attention also, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have.
Okay. Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. And, um, and this is actually something... Okay, so the question was, we, we analyzed advanced AMD cases together, so we, we lumped GA and CMD, yeah. and at the very end then tried to maybe make sense uh, to differentiate between the two forms. The question is, um, is that a valid approach maybe, or is, why are we doing this? So, yeah, so one thing we, we already knew before doing this analysis is that the genetic risk factors that are known are shared between the two late stage forms. So CSH, ARMS2, and the other compound genes that are associated with wet AMD as well as with dry AMD. There are some slight differences in the effect sizes, but overall the, the risk factors we knew, we knew at that time were associated with both late stage forms. So you can imagine by, by pooling them together, we have more power to identify them because they are associated with both late stage forms. And what we did, we, we also tried to, um, to understand if there, to, to estimate the, the overlap between genetic risk factors between those late stage forms and we estimated this overlap to be about 80%. So kind of um, confirming our approach that it is helpful to analyze them together. But also we were able to analyze them separately. So I presented the whole genome and the, the, the GBAS of the advanced AMD forms, but also we did the same for C and D only compared to, uh, to GA only. And that's how we came up with this one locus that is specific to for C and D. But overall what we could see is that the signals are much weaker in those um, stratified analyses. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a power issue. And, and we have for geographic atrophy, we had, I think, only, so compared to CMD, um, much smaller sample size, less power to, to identify risk factors GA, GA. So there might be still GA specific risk factors, but we might not have enough powers to identify them. Okay, that's an excellent question, and ABCF4 is also an excellent example because it's also an, a monogenetic um, macular degeneration. And when we designed our error, we actually took care of this gene, and so we added custom <coughs> content to to analyze um, disease as disease variants, also disease associated variants, and so we, we analyzed them. But um, the, the mode of inheritance of, uh, as, you, as you know, of, of Stargardt, model Stargardt, or Stargardt disease, um, is, uh, is um, recessive or a compound. Excuse me. Uh, oh, so no, so source free fundus dystrophy is an autosomal dominant inheritance, I guess, and, and Stargardt disease is autosomal recessive inheritance. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, exactly. That's what I meant. Yeah, and and so the approach that we used, uh, focusing on single variants, or in, in the gene-based test and, and on, on on pooling those variants, but we did not consider the homozygosity of variants or the compound homozygosity of those variants. So we might have used the, the wrong model to 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 test for those associations. But when we used the single variants or a gene-based test, we could not find any signal in the ABCA1 gene, and this could be because of we we, we require at least two of those variants to cause the disease. Um, but these are situations that are hard to uh, discover in, in such an analysis. You're absolutely right. And can you also comment on the quality of your controls in your own analysis? How, how well did you manage to have we On one hand, we had hospital-based controls, so they were analyzed and free of signs of any macular degeneration, but also we had population-based controls, so they were recruited um, um, in, in, in population without screening for uh, signs of AMD, um, but this dilution uh, the of, of using maybe there might be some AMD patients among them 
um, we found that it is still beneficial to, to, add, to use those population controls. We kind of, so the dilution by using, is it dilution? Yeah, using um, potential ND cases is pretty, pretty small because we expect that the prevalence of ND uh, is, is small compared to the actual controls that are added. So, but, it, but you're right, it would make sense to have better phenotype controls to, have to make sure that we don't have any signs of, of AMD or any signs of other eye diseases in our controls. We can compare them with extremely well phenotyped cases and I think this is one of the next steps to get better phenotype and better characterization to do better statistical analysis. Um, that's also a very good question, and um, it's uh, it's hard to answer. So, 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 if you, for example, if you you don't have any signs of AMD, um, using this these variants for presymptomatic testing, you might identify some variant, some some individuals that have a higher risk. But actually, we we showed that maybe not all of them will develop AMD at the very end. And so, what can you do? What can you recommend? You probably, hey, um, you can um, live a healthy life, exercise, but you don't need genetic testing to do this, right? And, um, and if you have um, early signs of AMD, large drusen, um, a lot of clinicians, they will increase the frequency of visits by seeing early signs of AMD. You don't need, need a genetic test to, 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 uh, to, to examine this patient, but but the genetic risk itself might have an influence on the progression of the disease. So it might help you to better predict how soon will this person develop late stage AMD. But then again, what can you do? What can you help? How can you help this patient? So it's, it's a tough question. I personally, I don't want to get tested. So <laughs> I rely to the clinicians to, to find early signs of AMD and then react accordingly. So they have, so those companies they have uh, they they use published results and so they generate uh, a, a test that incorporates most of those variants that were published at that date, um, um, and they come up with a risk score and they also incorporate age and maybe smoking behavior and they might give you an, a percentage what's your risk of developing age in the next few years I don't know, like that but. But as I might have shown you is that there are multi multiple variants that were not considered in those tests. So you might have a, a risk profile. You get a risk profile of those companies saying, oh, you have a very low risk, but you might have one of those rare TIM3 variants. And that will guar maybe guarantee that you will develop AMD, but it was not tested. So on a population-based level, those tests might make sense. But on the individual level, um, there are many factors that can influence the actual personal risk. So I'm, I don't know. So those companies, they have their, their goals and they have promises and some of them are helpful, might help you to plan the future, but I don't know exactly how it's used. Exactly, yeah. No, we, we, um, okay, so the question is why couldn't we find any GA specific signals in our data? So on the one hand, this is the sample size. So we could, so what we did, we compared C and we compared the, the, the variants in, we compared C and D versus GA and we could, some, we could identify some differences. So there were differences in the effect sizes between GA and CMV, but those effects were observable in, in both late stage forms. 
So, so they were associated in both late stage forms, but there was a difference in the effect size. And, and, and I could imagine that there are some GA specific variants in the genome that can be discovered, but not, maybe not with this sample size, maybe not with this platform. So we have a selection of non synonymous variants that were tested. We imputed some variants, 11 million, 12 million variants that were tested. It seems to be a lot, but there are many more variants to be tested. And so the next goal, I think, is whole genome, whole exome sequencing to get all the variants in, in the exomes or, or whole genome sequencing data. But it is quite expensive, still quite expensive to, to reach the large sample sizes that are required to test those variants. But yeah, we are looking for those GA specific variants as well. Thanks so much.